Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, Dr. Mark Sims here. I am the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Listening, the Arizona Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss, to stay better socially connected, and to be able to have better conversations and relationships with their loved ones. I am also the head of Arizona Hearing Center, which is a clinical practice, medical practice. I am the E of ENT. I only take care of ear problems. I've treated tens of thousands, over 10,000 patients with surgery, treated thousands of patients with hearing loss. I've also written a book called Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you'd like to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com and you can learn more about the book. I'm uh, uh, The reason I am so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother Robbie twice. I lost him first to hearing loss from radiation to a brain tumor and then later from complications from that brain tumor. I'm intimately aware of how hearing loss affects people, and I'm passionate to get it better treated. Today, I'm excited for my guest. I have Dr. Abrams. He is a academic, clinical, he served in the military, done research, administrative audiology, you name the context, he's practiced in it. He spent most of his career at the Department of Veterans Affairs. He was the uh, director of, uh, or chief of audiology and speech pathology service, associate chief in Florida. He then went to work for at Trip or at I'm sorry uh, Walter Reed Medical Center as the director of audiology. He moved on to work at Starkey Technologies as a research in, in the director of research in audiology, and now currently serves as the head of audiology or head of research audiology at Lively Hearing Corporation, a teleaudiology focused company. He received his undergraduate degree from George Washington University and his master's and doctoral training in audiology and hearing science at Uni- University of Florida. His research is focused on the treatment and efficacy of improved quality of life associated with audiologic intervention to include most recently computer-based auditory training. Boy, that's a mouthful, but you have a distinguished career and welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming along. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sim. Thank you for that introduction and also for the opportunity to talk with you and be part sure. of it. So I'm going to call you Harvey and you're going to call me Mark, right? That'll be- Sounds like a deal. Thank you. Yeah. So tell me, you know, at some point you weren't an audiologist. How did you end up in audiology? I always am fascinated by people's pathway to that. Yeah, well, you know, audiology is not a profession you kind of grow up wanting to get into, <laughs> particularly when uh, I was in undergraduate school. It's still fairly a new profession coming out of uh, World War II, essentially. And uh, But I took some courses in the speech department at uh, George Washington, and within that were courses in audiology and speech pathology. And that's what got me kind of interested. And, you know, as part of that, too, of course, uh, this is during Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. And, uh, you know, if you were a college student, you had a deferment, but then I had to consider what was going to happen after graduation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I thought audiology would be a medically focused uh, um profession where I might be of some use other than as a combat um, infantryman in Vietnam. And um, as it turns out, though, I I applied for a commission, um, but there were no commissions available. So I got drafted, um, actually, while I was in uh, graduate school. And uh, my uh, kind draft board, which was in Coney Island, (laughs) allowed me to finish my uh, graduate training. But then as soon as that was over, uh, I had to go in. So I went in as a as a buck private. I went to basic training at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then to combat medic training at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And it was in the middle of that training where my commission came through. So I went from a private to first lieutenant overnight. And that's so, a good promotion. Oh, it was a nice promotion. And what was interesting is that medical uh, core training was also at Sam Houston. So I. I just stayed at the same place. It changed my uniform, um, which was a surprise to my um, non-commissioned officer friends yeah. at the time. Yeah, well, that, that's really nice. And so you then ended up being an audiologist in the Army, right? So yeah. you had done a PhD, though, correct? Uh, not at that point. I only had my master's degree at that point. I uh, had, you know, had to go in get, and, and do my service. Uh, sure. But I spent the uh, first tour at uh, U.S. Army Hospital in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I was the first audiologist ever signed there. This is where the 101st Airborne Division uh, trained and deployed right. from. And uh, I was also the first uh, hearing conservation officer there. 
Um, so I provided both clinical care um, at the time, which consisted when I first got there, but one audiometer, uh, in which I helped to expand that program over the few years I was there. And then also was responsible for ensuring that both military and civilian personnel on the base uh, were adequately protected from the um, many More sources of noise. Exactly. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And so then you left and you did a you did a PhD in Florida. And, and what was your area of uh, research in your PhD? Yeah. So I, actually, that was informed by my work in my second assignment in the military. I was assigned to the um, U.S. Army Environmental Hygiene Agency, which was a branch of Aberdeen Proving Ground. It was a lab. And the particular uh, division I was assigned to is the bioacoustics division here in conservation branch. And so we did some research. We wrote policy. We were responsible for uh, reviewing uh, programs throughout the uh, U.S., um, Army depots, as well as training facilities. Sure. And uh, I had one uh, kind of a research assignment was to evaluate noise uh, noise levels in incubators, of all things. This must have been a concern, came to our lab for measurements, uh, which I did. And, you know, not surprisingly, as you probably know, the noise levels in and of themselves in incubators do not exceed OSHA's damage risk criteria. Okay, but those are written for adults, right, in occupational noise settings. And uh, it, it, I, it was very curious to me um, whether or not those noise levels might be of um, a particular hazard to newborns. And so under the GI Bill, I went back, I uh, went to get my PhD at the University of Florida, and that was my focus in terms of my research, was looking at the um, effects of intense noise on newborn mammals. So my dissertation was to compare uh, noise exposures among newborn guinea pigs and adult guinea pigs, um, measure changes in thresholds, and then take a look at uh, hair cell damage. And uh, in fact, the newborns uh, sustained greater threshold shift exposed to the same noise for the same period of time. Not it would seem to make sense, but maybe that's built in based on your that press work that it seems intuitive to me. Yeah. So, that's great. And so then you had a career in the... Uh, uh, military into the VA, right? Correct. Yeah. And so you finish that up and then, you know, what most people would do when they retire from a job, they go work at Starkey, right? So you went to work right. at Starkey. And yeah. so what, what did you do at Starkey? Well, yeah, especially um, after you've spent your career in mostly in Florida and uh, taking a position in Minneapolis. So um, that was a climate shock. Um, you didn't go for the weather. Uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, but it was great because uh, for most of my career, almost all of my career, I'm on the receiving end of technology as the clinician, uh, as somebody, as a researcher, um, as somebody administering both clinical and research programs. We're looking at the technology as, as it exists. Well, at Starkey, um, I have an opportunity to be on the front end. So here we're developing new technologies, technologies that may not be seen. Uh, in hearing aids for a, you know a year or two or three to come, or may never be seen, right. which was essentially the job of my department was to do the clinical trials to determine whether in this new and fancy algorithm is going to truly make a difference in terms of improving performance among people who are hearing impaired. So that was a lot of fun. I did that for five years, and then you know now I've been working I guess over. 45 years full time. As a, you know, I think that's enough. Um, but I didn't want necessarily to get out of the field. So I did some consulting. I've been doing teaching for a long time. I continue to do it. And then I got what do you call. teach? Oh, I teach uh, um, actually right now at three different universities. Arizona State is one of them. As a matter of fact, just prior to this uh, meeting, yeah, I, was, I was teaching uh, hearing conservation to ah. AUD students at ASU. Seems it's uh, right in your uh, your wheelhouse. Indeed, yeah. And then uh, I teach uh, West Virginia. I teach a hearing aids uh, course there. And at Salis uh, University outside of Philly, right. I teach uh, um, rehabilitation, auditory rehabilitation course. Wow, ah, so you're doing different classes too. That's great. It's great and it's a heck of a lot of work because you got to. Uh, yeah, well, you yeah. know, teaching is is a, a, yeah, it's a, a lot a, of work. Level. So, so you're teaching and you so you are consulting, minding your own business, and yep. then uh, what happened? I get a call from one of the founders of this new company. It's called Lively Lively Hearing Corporation, and what they want to do is to 
emulate the brick and mortar experience, except do it all remotely. And that really appealed to me, particularly after being uh, in the field as long as I have been and uh, appreciating the value that uh, hearing help has for individuals with hearing loss in terms of just improving their quality of life. Yet we know that uh, just a small minority of individuals who can benefit actually have hearing aids. And, you know, we can talk forever about some of those barriers, but obviously two of them are cost and, and accessibility. So it's affordability and accessibility. And these were two of the barriers identified by some external uh, reviewers, the uh, what's called PCAS, the Presidential Council of Advisors in, in Technology, and as well as uh, NASM, the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine. Um, and uh, the lively model, at least on paper, uh, really seemed to be a possible solution that we can provide um, high quality, um, and I'll call it audiologic care because we try to emulate the brick and mortar model, um, but through a remote um, model. We do everything remotely. So by eliminating a lot of the costs associated with conventional practices, we can reduce the cost. Um, and then accessibility, of course, is, is your PC or your iPhone, essentially. So we've been around now for about two and a half years. We still consider ourselves a startup company. And apparently it's kind of resonated with um, the general public because we've been quite successful. Um, the difference between what we do and perhaps what um, your listeners might uh, understand to be over-the-counter or other direct-to-consumer devices is we maintain the audiologist as a central component of this model. We're, we're involved in terms of the client journey from the very beginning to the through three years, essentially. Um, so we uh, work with them in terms of establishing goals. We uh, establish goals through the COSI, Client-Oriented Scale of Improvement, which is a standardized measure of uh, outcomes. We then determine the extent to which those goals have been met after 30 days. We can make any adjustments remotely. Uh, we have a huge um, a cohort of uh audiology personnel, not only audiologists, but uh, audiology assistants, hearing instrument specialists, as well as trained customer support staff. So constantly providing a high level of support throughout the entire journey. Just out of curiosity, it's not, a, I'm sure you figure it out, but how does licensure work? Oh, our uh, audiologists are licensed in multiple states. And so- um, In our regions first... or something, people serve different regions or something? Yes, ex exactly right. Yes. Um, and so the design, of course, is to pr have them get their license in those states where we're likely to get uh, the most uh, number of clients requesting our services. Uh, you know, we started out with an audiologist, a clinical audiologist of one. Um, she was licensed in 48 states, wow. believe it or not. Yes. But now we have, um, oh, gee, uh, audiology department is now over like 45 people. Um, so we spread, we spread the wealth. How do you standardize the care? Oh, and because we've been doing this for as long as we have, we have uh, standardized uh, procedures in terms of care. So from every step along the way, what gets done, who does it, how does it get done? It's kind of a very standardized uh, method. Um, but not detracting, of course, from the fact that whenever you're dealing with humans, you deviate from uh, standards. But right. That's the art of uh, healthcare, as you well know. Right. And is there a fitting range uh, that you guys do or don't do? Or Yeah, so we're not, we don't build our own hearing aids, uh, Mark. We use um, premium hearing aids that are provided by one of the major manufacturers. We use Resound uh, hearing aids. We use their top of the line um, model. So that range um, is quite quite wide. Now there are the fitting range of the technology, not, exactly. not that yes. you're going to do people with only certain disease, correct? Indeed, that's right. Now, an important um, component of our model is uh, risk uh, management, risk identification. People will ask, well, how do you know you're not fitting somebody with ear disease, somebody who could be treated uh, medically? Well, we use an instrument it's called the CEDRA, the Consumer Ear Disease Risk Assessment. This was developed by researchers at Northwestern and Mayo, Florida, uh, and an NIH grant. 
Um, it's a series of questions. And depending on how many yes questions, each question gets a number of points. Depending on the number of points, this is a red flag that uh, this individual may be at risk of uh, ear disease or otoneurologic disease. Those all get screened. Um, and it may be, for instance, uh, that somebody says, yes, I have hearing loss in one ear. Um, as you well know, that's a red flag. Um, right. But in, when we get back to the patient, it may, oh, yeah, I was born with a hearing loss in one ear. All right. Or I have, yes, I, I've had a state, I have conductive hearing loss, but this is something that's been treated at a stapedectomy. I had a hole in my eardrum that was repaired. Yes, exactly point. right. So we're, we're very, very um, conscious of the uh, risks associated with doing totally online examination. And we kind of go overboard in ensuring that we're not providing hearing aids to somebody who could benefit uh, from medical care or who should be seen uh, before we provide any amplification. Do you have a way to assess wearing percentage or how much time they wear? Um, we have the data logging, of course, from the manufacturer. Although I haven't seen that data, Mark. That's a that's a good question. I think that's something we will be looking at uh, again. We, as being a fairly new company, right. um, you're you're kind of getting the important. Yeah, no, I'm I'm just right. thinking out loud. To be honest, sure. it's just kind of like you know. I mean, there are you know in the in our space. Obviously, it's it's not that it happens that often, but it's one thing to get a cochlear implant. It's another thing to get a cochlear implant and wear it. Right? Wear, of course. So, yeah. You know, wear times are are a challenge sometimes in certain populations. So one of the features of our model that might encourage uh, wear time is uh, a well, or two. One is our close follow up. Uh, two is the fact they have a hundred days to return the hearing aid. So if after you know 50 days or something, they're finding, eh, you know, this is really not helping me and we really can't resolve it, then they return it. Um, you know, no questions asked, no money lost. Sure, sure. Uh, and so what is your follow-up once they kind of become stable? How often do you follow them up as needed type of thing? Or? Right. So it is often up to them. Um, now, because we've only been around for about two and a half years. Right, you're not even had 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 three like years of apology, right? Right. right? So, and many of our uh, many of our uh, clients may be previous hearing aid users. Um, they may want this lively hearing aid, maybe as a backup, of course. But now that they have this new hearing aid, now it becomes their primary hearing aid, and their first hearing aid becomes the backup. But they're experienced hearing aid users. They know to reach out if they're having problems. Many of them don't need to. We uh, will always schedule an appointment within 30 days. Now, sometimes for those particular cases, the uh, clients may say, yeah, that's okay. I'm doing fine. I really don't need it, right? Sure, sure. Um, but we, uh, for new hearing aid users, we absolutely want to make sure that for our own purposes, we're meeting their goals. We, this is an important uh, data set for us on the COSI, right. right? What percentage of our clients um, have improved in those specific uh, needs areas that they've identified. Um, and it's particularly uh, interesting, Mark, uh, that when we compare those individuals that take our online hearing test against those who upload a hearing test that was completed in a clinic, there is no difference in terms of their clinical outcomes. I, I found that kind of reassuring because obviously we can't be as precise in terms of an online hearing test as a kind of examination they will get um, uh, in a clinic. Right. So, uh, I mean, they do uh, uh, word uh, recognition scores as well? No, not uh, not currently. Um, we're looking to develop a model where we can do at least uh, like digits and noise. Uh, this is something we're planning in a kind of a future iteration. Right yeah. now, they're just, they're kind of warm tones. Right? Yeah. And, and so that's actually one of the things that's fascinating. Like, where do you see, like, okay, so you know, who knows, right? Where this is all going, but let's say you could, you know, fast forward five years, like what does it all look like? I mean, this is obviously all conjecture. I'm not going to hold you to it, although it'll be interesting to look back five years from now, but you know, wh where do you see this going? I mean, you're on the forefront of all that. I love thinking about five years ahead and, uh, it, it, you know, my classes I, I teach, there's um, a class I teach on emerging technologies. So I'm kind of looking ahead. And so what are we seeing? What we're seeing, um, and of course, AI and machine learning as applied to hearing technology. 
we're seeing. Um, what does that mean? Like, so it means it learns circumstance or how, you know, I mean, that I'm, I'm not saying I, I want to understand it because it's kind of a buzzword thrown around in software and all this stuff. So for hearing, yeah. what's that to help me to get that? All right. Let, so let me uh, describe it in the context of maybe five years ago. Okay. We fit a hearing aid. We program it to a particular prescription. And then we may have programs. So this program is for noisy oh, instruments. This program is for music. And they are essentially deviations from the basic program that's uh, set to optimize speech understanding. Now that's that's fine, but now we have systems that will classify an environment and will change the parameters in response to that environment, but will query the user in terms of how much they like it. And this gets to another element Spontaneous feedback in the circumstances. It's, it's you can feedback. collect the data of what's going right. on there, right? Yes. Now, and, and there's another phenomenon, another technological um, advancement that we're going to see. It's called ecological momentary assessment. That's kind of part of this. So when we um, evaluate individuals' um, benefit, we have them come back 30 days and say, okay, you said you're having problems in the restaurant, you know, when, when you go with your wife after religious services. So how's the hearing aid doing? And so, well, it's okay, but I'm having some, still having a problem. Audiologists make some adjustments, send them back out, and maybe follow up again. What ecological momentary assessment does is that it pushes a notification to the user in real time, in real space. Ooh, um, I'm your assistant, and I I see you're in a noisy environment. So how are you doing with your hearing aids in this noisy environment? Um, and may give you maybe five smiley to sad faces or a rank order from one to five. And, and maybe you hit two, um, which means you're yeah, not that pleased. It says, okay, let me make some changes to it. And the algorithm makes some changes. It says, how do you like it now? Better or worse, right? So, so it's it, fine it, 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 for the circumstance. For the circumstance. Now, once that is known, then when that individual is in any similar situation with a similar acoustic signature, the parameters will revert to what the individual determined was the best response. So that's kind of machine learning at that time. And in addition, it, it, it's also somewhat automatic because we're getting better in terms of an environmental classification. So yes. hearing instruments, no, here's, here's noise. Yeah, we're going to do this. But there's speech in that noise, so let's do this. But here's music, and so let's do this. But here's here's a different kind of noise. This is your vacuum cleaner, so let's do this. So that kind of sophistication in terms of environmental classification. So, all right, so we've talked about AI or machine learning, ecological momentary assessment. There's also what's happening is self-fitting, and we're already seeing that, you know, the Bose device is self-fitting. And what's interesting with self-fitting is that research has uh, revealed that individuals can self-fit their devices and end up with a setting that's very similar to what the prescriptive settings would be if they were in a clinic and an audiologist was actually setting the parameters. So that's getting more sophisticated. So my gosh, now you've got devices that are self-fitting, have um, sophisticated classification, um, uh, environmental classification schemes, will um, self-adjust uh, on the basis of feedback they get from the user. So, um, so what the heck do we need clinicians for? What do we need an audiologist for, right? And that's always the question, and that's always the concern. But this kind of gets back to any of us audiologists who've really been focused on the rehabilitative aspects of audiology. We see this as a wonderful opportunity, right? We offload kind of the technology to, you know, the great world of, of um, sophistication. And, but now we're dealing with the issues associated with hearing loss. And how does hearing loss affect you as an individual? How does it affect your family? How does it affect your major communication partners, and, right. and what does that mean, and how we how can we develop programs and support uh, to assist you in managing 
uh, these feelings, these sensations, these consequences, sure. even when you have this great technology, because we know technology is not going to resolve all of these problems, particularly as we get older, right? And and we still we have the consequences of aging and central auditory processing issues like working memory, speed of processing, and spatial release of masking. And perhaps now we have other kinds of training tools, such as auditory training games that we can utilize. So there's tremendous opportunities for rehabilitative audiologists, even in the face of these amazing technological advancements. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And so how how does the technology validate that it's delivering the, the maximum audibility? It's essentially feedback from the individual. In the end, that feedback is what is most important. But you bring up a good point. Um, and that is we've known often when we initially fit an individual with a hearing aid, we'll fit it for optimum audibility. But right. initial hearing aid users will often object. Oh, it's just no, they don't like it. And it's just too tinny. Their brain and ear don't like it. That's Yes. Sure. But another wonderful advancement in hearing aid technology, they call sort of um, uh, adjustment managers, right? Adaptation managers. So they hear you, the hearing aid gets fit below what those maximum audibility targets would be. And then like the frog in boiling water, we slowly <laughs> increase the gain um, until it's really not noticeable to the user. But over several weeks, we've reached the point where we've gotten optimum uh, audibility and hopefully intelligibility and as they adapt to amplification anyway. Um, and so the, here's an, another technological advancement to works to our advantage and to the patient's advantage. Well, which increases the role for the counseling and the rehabilitation portion. And that too. You're absolutely right. Yes. That, that, that's that's pretty amazing stuff. And so, all right, that's five years. What do we got at 20? Huh. At 20, we have uh, s- sort of the, the, the biological and biochemical uh, advancements. That Gene was therapy, hair cell regeneration. Right, exactly right. So, but, so let me ask you this. Yeah, you're interviewing me, but I, I always throw this out. In any types of um, pharmaceutical or or surgical advancements, very often they are only accessible to a certain segment of the population, right? Um, To those who happen to live in a society where that's provided, where it's afforded. So if you look at the World Health Organization um, disability projections, you know, we're looking at, at hundreds of millions of individuals around the world. Hearing we're going to have hearing loss. They will not uh, be able to access these wonderful pharmaceutical and biochemical and gene therapeutic advancements. So I think the role for us you know, in, in terms of not going away is not going away. Not not in twenty years. Not in 15 right. Years. Which which would be similar to saying you know I mean kind of on a more basic speech reading and contextual skills to help communicate aren't going away either despite hearing aids, right? So oh, I love that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, and I, know. I teach that to my students. I teach that to my patients. Absolutely. Okay. You know, um, very often just knowing the context, just looking at somebody and knowing the context gets you 95% there, right? Right, right. Yeah. And that's that obviously, you know, in the context of the pandemic, the masks have been very difficult oh. for the impaired. Right, and that's really revealed um, More hearing the loss. problems, um, even for those with slight hearing losses. It's kind of changed that scale. We always used to say, well, you have hearing, it's yeah, better than 25. to moderate to mild, you know, past mild to moderate to really realize you had it. If you have a, you have a 20 dB hearing loss, maybe a mild hearing loss in the high frequencies, somebody's wearing a mask. Um, you know, it's a different ball game. You're going to miss a lot of what's being said. Yeah, uh, I was having some guys at um, Boys Town. They were they they actually, you know, at the bottom part of normal, right? There's yes. definitely uh, yes. functional implications, right? And so, you know, that gets into the whole intellectual question of why is it zero to twenty five and uh, and all of those things, which is kind of interesting that somebody just kind of divided it up and made it that way. I'm not sure it's really data driven. Well, it's, it's compensation-based, Mark. Right. Those That's like the really percentage based. of hearing loss question right. I get all the time, right? Yes, exactly. Right. I mean, I when, when, when are we going to pay out? When are we going to pay out for hearing loss? Well, we're not going to do it if you got 15 dB, right? right. No, 25. Yeah, maybe that's the low fence. Above that, I mean, we'll we'll pay you something. 
Yeah, but it's going to be interesting, right? Because our maybe our language has to change, right? To start, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, um, what is a little bit of high blood pressure? Yes, very right? good. So, yes. you know, the concept of what is a little bit of hearing loss or many patients will tell me, well, I saw somebody and said, it wasn't that bad. And as I always go, well, what, 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 when somebody tells you you have high blood pressure and they say that's not bad, what do you think? Right, yeah. so it's, it's definitely a paradigm about the uh, whole issue, right? Yes, with hearing loss, um, maybe it's a little easier because blood pressure, of course, you don't feel that your blood pressure is a little high. With hearing loss, maybe you do notice you're having slight problem. So the question is that not always that it's not noticeable, but that it's not to the point where it's having any significant impact on me or my quality of life. As we know, that's the best predictor of whether or not people take action. It's right. not the results of a screening test. It's not even the result of a clinical test where the clinician will tell you, you know what, you've got a hearing loss here. This is not normal, right? And we say, well, yeah, but I turn the TV up a little bit. I'm, I'm fine. It's not until the individual themselves perceive their hearing loss is impacting their quality of life that they finally are going to take some action. And that's always a challenge for us. Right. right. No, I agree. But, you know, I know there was some work recently done about what is normal hearing, right? And what that number means, like 2020 for vision. And, and it does become a struggle, you know, when it's not defined what normal hearing is and maybe what we do define as normal hearing really isn't normal. Right? Yes. And then there's the whole issue of synapto synaptopathology, 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 the hidden hearing loss, right? Correct. The fact that hearing can be close to normal, but there are underlying physiologic changes that are impacting on the individual's performance, particularly in, in high noise. Uh, right. Well, the brain has so much to do with it, right? And so that's the thing that, and so, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, just because you hear Mandarin Chinese doesn't mean your brain's able to understand it. <laughs> because you hear things doesn't mean your brain's processing it. And I, it's a simplified analogy, but, you know, in difficult listening environments, it's kind of that concept, right? Your brain doesn't have the capacity. Uh, totally. Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, 20 years from now, obviously, the interplay between hearing loss and the brain will be better understood, uh, whether that pathology is dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever it is. Um, even, you know, it's maybe not considered a pathology, but social isolation and what impact that has. I, I think all of that work will be done in the next uh, several decades. It'll be fascinating to see what comes. And uh, the lecture I, I just gave at ASU was on children and adolescents. And we know that they are also at risk simply because of the types of noises they're exposed to, A, and because they're teenagers, and right, <laughs> right then they don't recognize the risks. And so how do you get them to appreciate what may be happening? How do you get them to wear hearing protection? How do you get adults to wear hearing protection? That's always been a challenge. Fortunately, there have been some advancements in hearing protection technology, for instance. And, uh, and things like that, yeah. Right, uh, level-dependent devices, filtering devices that don't distort the music, flattens out the response. So sort of makes it more likely people are going to wear and protect their hearing. And I think we're seeing, certainly, if you ever go to a concert and parents have brought their young children, they've got their, you know, their earmuffs on. Thank you. Thank yes, you yes, parents. yes. That's yeah, great. very much so. Yeah, they have their, a lot of them are wearing shooters mug, uh, uh, shooters. Oh, yeah, as well, right? Yeah. 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 Well, at the concerts. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. So they're giving their kid their uh, thing. So that's great. So, you know, two of the questions I always ask, sorry. one is, is, uh, you know, who would you like to thank? Like, who are the people who made the greatest impact in your life to where you are today in terms of your mentors and stuff? Um, that's one question I love to ask people. Or yeah, well, I, I've had some outstanding colleagues. And uh, when I was at um, at the VA, um, shortly after I got there, I had a new faculty member that joined the University of South Florida, where I had a teaching appointment, uh, Teresa Chisholm is who that is. And she came from CUNY, yes, City University of New York, PhD mm -hmm. program, outstanding researcher. And we just developed the greatest working relationship um, because we could use the um, patients we had at the VA as participants right. and use her wonderful research design um, skills. And so we were able to have a great string of- uh, Endless clinical material. Yes, in clinical material. And we were uh, successfully funded through the VA 
uh, merit review process. Uh, we had several uh, projects. We were funded large, multi-centered project looking at uh, auditory uh, rehabilitation, group rehabilitation uh, programs, the how effective they are and why they're effective, where they're effective and so forth. Uh, so she really had a tremendous influence on my career, sort of moving me um, out of the clinic and, and research uh, and, and administrative space into sort of a research clinical researcher. And uh, so I absolutely want to thank her. She has gone on to have a stellar career in research. She became chair of the department and now she's vice provost at the University of South Florida. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. Yes. Good for her. That sounds like Indeed. Great. Yeah. So. Uh, and that relationship also is good because it became almost seamless. Um, we their students would come to the VA as as trainees. We had a very robust uh, traineeship uh, program. We had as many as eleven students um, at our uh, VA. Um, oh, that's a lot at any one time. So and that's always enjoyable, of course, when you have students at your training. And they also engaged in our research program. We developed uh, researchers from. Uh, from the inside, um, one of whom, uh, Dr. Rachel McCardle, became a, a funded researcher, went on to develop her own independent research career. And now uh, she is now the uh, um, uh, head of uh, national um, VA National Audiology and Speech Pathology Program. Wow. Um, so, I mean, that's the joy for me, of course, is just seeing a lot of progeny. These students, um, mm -hmm. yes, indeed. Right. And progeny now are teaching me things. Right? That's great. That's that's really the joy. Oh, right? That's great. Thanks. And then the yeah, last question I like to ask everybody is what's your favorite sound? Oh, favorite sound. That's funny. I was just thinking about that the other day. Do you ever that's the sound of the a baby, maybe six month old and their belly laughs. These yeah. uncontrollable laughs. It's so contagious. That right. It's kind of a feedback loop yeah. because, you know, they laugh and then we laugh and then they laugh at, because we're laughing and we're laughing because they're laughing. I love that sound. Just uncontrollable joy and laughter. That, without doubt, is my favorite sound. That's yeah. awesome. So, so <laughs> thank you so much for your time with us today. We have uh, Dr. Harvey Avery. He is the uh, director of uh, audiology research at Lively. If people wanted to reach out and get a hold of you, where would they get a hold of you? LinkedIn or where would they get a hold of you? Yeah, LinkedIn is great. Yeah, take take a look there, message me. And then uh, if we want to extend the conversation, I'll give you my regular email address. All right, Thank great. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been great. It's been fascinating stuff. I really appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for again, again for the invitation, Mark. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.